want to say a personal thanks to Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman for their incredible support in making it possible to bring this program to you. So um, it's a company that really stands firmly behind supporting women's initiatives. And I know for Working, Working Women magazine, they were rated one of the top firms to work for because of their support for women. So kudos to Pillsbury for that. So we're delighted to be here this morning with Svetlana Kim. Svetlana is a personal friend of mine. And we met probably about two years ago, three more years than ago, that. more than that, while you were in the process of writing your book, yeah. White Pearl and I. <laughs> and your story is compelling and fascinating. It really goes to the heart of what it is to be brave, to take risk, and to stand in the face of those challenges and persevere when everything is against you and you probably shouldn't do it. So Svetlana, I'm really happy to have you here today because your story is so fascinating. Just to give you a brief background, and many of you have already read the invitation, Lana immigrated to this country with one dollar in her pocket, a pair of jeans, two t-shirts, a pair of shoes, and when she landed here with her one dollar in New York City, um, on her journey, I think all your possessions were also stolen. On a bus. On a bus. <laughs> so, um, so fascinating. So Lana, let's go back to your journey because you are of Korean descent, and how much Korean do you speak? None. Okay. <laughs> What's really fascinating is Lana is actually um, Russian, and her native language is Russian. So it's always, do people come up to you who are Korean descent and start talk, speaking to you in Korean and assume that you speak Korean? Chinese. I guess because I have a big face, my dad's face, and I'm much taller and I have bigger boobs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, you know, yeah, okay, so now when people, I actually lived in Japan for five years, so I'm very familiar with the, there's very subtle differences between people of Asian descent, but for a lot of Americans, I think it's difficult for them to begin to distinguish that. It's subtle, but, but you definitely see it. But I remember when I was in Japan one time, we had um, our nanny, one time she said, you know what's funny about Americans, you all look alike. <laughs> I go, really? Yeah. <laughs> with my standing next to my sister, who's five foot ten. Anyway. So you were born and raised in Russia. Correct. And your story begins with you standing in line to buy a loaf of bread that actually did not exist. Let's go back to that story. I think it's so fascinating. Um, she read my book. That's my first line. It was December of 1991, three months before the collapse of former Soviet Union, when the wall came down. And shelves in a store were just bare. Um, all the products vanished from the stores, including necessities, uh, food, toothpaste, shampoo, shoes, uh, you name it. So I was standing on the bread line for third day, and everyone is just complaining. You know, someone talks about that Gorbachev needs to resign, and the whole country is just in, in a bad shape, economic shape. Um, and all of a sudden, they stopped talking, and I turned my head. And I saw a black Mercedes pulled up to the curb. And the guy rolls the window down and yells, people, do we have bread or will you have to go home and eat potatoes? Oh my gosh, I start laughing. It was my old classmate, Vladimir. He had oversized Versace sunglasses in December. And he had leather coat. And I said, Russian mafia. So we start the conversation because he had the biggest crush of, on, on my best girlfriend, Ludmila, who moved to New York and who invited me to visit her. And the conversation started, are you going to visit her? And I said, oh, Vladimir, you know, I don't speak English, I don't have money, and it's impossible to get visa and airline ticket. And he said, I have one. And I said, I'll buy it. He said, you can't afford it. I said, it's a done deal. And he looked at me and he said, deal is not done until I have the cash in my hands. Mafia. <laughs> Here I am, less than 10 days, raising money, lots of money, almost like $1,000, um, praying for a visa, packing my stuff, and flying to United States. That is absolutely fascinating. So life in Russia at that time was very, very difficult. So even if you were in the mafia or whatever, you still had trouble getting your hands on bread and some of the sustenance you needed in life. So that must have been a huge challenge for you. So describe for us what your life was like in Russia. What were you doing for work? Were you in school? What was, what was it like in your family life? What was, it like, what was your housing like then? Um, 
I was raised by my grandparents. Um, my grandmother is 95 years old. She lives in former Soviet Union in the uh, city of uh, Almaty, which is uh, close to, toward to China. China. Um, she is an incredible human being. I think she is the one who has ultra, ultra optimism for everything in her life. She is the most loving, giving, the most generous person. She used to cook every night for 20 people. When she sold her house and moved in with her youngest daughter, the challenge was that grandma could not use small pots because her pots were like the size of the bucket. And here she's downsized and cooking for a smaller family. And people would come to our house for dinner without any invitations. I used to see, you know, from five to six to seven to tw sometimes 20 people. And the conversation they have and the stories they told was so fascinating to me. And watching my grandmother cook, she sings, she moves, she dances, she laughs to herself. And then she would tell me all the stories about my mom breaking her favorite dishes and cups and, you know, some of her friends uh, biting uh, uh, teaspoons, her favorite teaspoon. There is always a story. Anything that we would touch, there is always a story. And I think the most I like about my grandmother is um, really her outlook. She's always positive. She never talked bad about anybody. She loved everybody. She embraced everybody. And one of the stories that is not in my book was told by my aunt um, after I submitted manuscript to the publisher. My grandmother went to a local farmer's market where she used to sell herbs for many, many years to raise her grandchildren. And she saw a woman, a homeless woman, and she said, do I know you? And the woman was just covering her face. She said, no, you don't, and go away. And my grandmother thought that it's suspicious. It's probably the person she knows. And this woman happened to be one of our neighbors. And my grandmother said, I can't leave you on the street. You are like my sister to me. I can't. So she brought her home, give her a bath, give her a clean clothes. And this woman died at our house. And my grandmother gave her a funeral. Wow. And if, if I'm sorry. And I, when my, my aunt shared the story, and I said, if I would be just a little bit like my grandmother, compassionate toward two strangers, I would be much richer. That's, that's an incredible story. That is just, um, I think it goes to explain your heritage and who you are as a person. You know, it's really interesting because you said your grandmother sold herbs on the street. I think you said, it told me earlier, your grandfather was a doctor and your, or was your father this is not My father. <coughs> your father's a doctor, but that your grandmother was really one, an early entrepreneur because she would sell herbs. Oh, she became so well off. She was making more money than my grandfather who is retired as an agriculturist. She was making three times more money than my father, who was a doctor, physician, um, than my mom, who was a midwife. She had that spirit. She retired as a preschool teacher to raise me because my parents were medical uh, students, so they, didn't, they couldn't afford to raise a child. And my cousin, who is four years older, and she's a doctor today. And being creative, she decided that she always loved working in a garden, raising um, uh, kids. And um, she turned into a venture. Uh, she was the first one in our family who purchased a TV set. She's the one who purchased the first car in 1975. That was unheard of. That's incredible. And one of the secret <laughs> is that she would pick up herbs in the morning. She didn't mind to wake up at 3 o'clock make the batches and go to the supermarket versus preparing all her stuff the night before. That is, I, and I think that's a really important part of your story.